Okay, Jeremiah 29 and verse 1. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. In other words, all the stuff we were talking about in this series actually happened. It actually happened. And then verse 2 in brackets, gives a description that this was after King Jehoiachin and the Queen Mother, the court officials and everyone else had gone into exile from Jerusalem. Verse 3, he entrusted the letter. And here's a description of how accurate the word of God is that this uh, careful historical document was preserved through these names like El Asa, son of Shaphan, and you see the other names there as well. And it said, verse 4, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So here it is. Here's the word of the Lord. And this might sound a strange thing for us to hear at first, but this is God's word to a people in exile. Build houses and settle down and plant gardens, and eat what they produce. Marry and and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into, into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I've not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. And now we come to this very famous verse of scripture. It's in this context of exile and and of God saying, you're going to be in exile for some time. This is my divine plan for you. And and so you just come to work this through. And then God says, verse 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And we need to read verse 12 as well, because this is the context. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. So Jeremiah 29, 11. Really, we're talking about that this morning. And we're trying to place it in context. But I want to ask straight away, if you've got a copy of Jeremiah 29, 11, I don't know, someone gave you a gift. It's a card or you got it on your wall or you've children, you've you've painted that or you've, you've written it in Sunday school. If you've got one of those copies somewhere in your house, would you just put your hand in the air right now? Put your hands up right. Quite a few of you have got that scripture. I don't know. It's all over our home because we arrived here on 29-11, 2005. And, uh, so, and lots of people sent us Jeremiah 29-11. So it's a very special verse uh, to our family, everyone. And you know something? Jeremiah doesn't tell many stories. Some of the prophets have much more dramatic illustration. We looked at the potter, uh, of course, for last week. But uh, Jeremiah especially is a wordsmith. And he brings words to us. And I want to say that God can speak to us through words. And God can speak to us through verses. And so it's important for us to uh, memorize scripture and to have that in our lives. Because you know what? The Holy Spirit will bring back to memory all that we have been taught. And Jesus said the Holy Spirit is a reminder. But let me tell you this. If you haven't filled your mind already with the word of God, there's nothing for the Holy Spirit to bring back. So we better fill ourselves with the Word of God, and then the Spirit of God will bring these scriptures back just at the right time. And if you don't know many Bible verses, Jeremiah 29, 11 is a wonderful verse of scripture to read. In fact, I asked Josh Harwell, our creative media, just to give us like a Christian bookstore picture of Jeremiah 29, 11. So here we go. 
He put a flower there. You know, Josh never does flowers. He's really, really cool. But it's like, okay, whatever, whatever uh, way that we remember Jeremiah 29, 11, let's, uh, let's remember that the Lord has plans for us. And I want to go over that again. God has plans, and God, I want to say this to you, my friend, God knows those plans already. He's already got those plans mapped out. Now, we don't know all the plans. He lets us in on some of the secrets, like preach the gospel to all the nations. He, he, he tells us much of what we should do, but God is the ultimate planner, and those plans are to prosper us. And we'll try and explain that and think very clearly what that prosperity means. God doesn't want to harm us, but his plans give us hope and a future. And so God wants to bless you. In fact, I want you to tell someone next to you right now, bless you. Would you just say bless you? Now, they didn't sneeze. I know they didn't sneeze, but you're allowed to say bless you to someone even when they haven't sneezed. Is that all right? But, uh, you know, God wants to, to bless us. He wants to prosper us. Isn't that a great thought? If you forget everything else, God loves you. God thinks you're special. God has plans for you. And he has, a, he has something that he wants to accomplish through your life. And so we really want to know what that actually means. And ultimately, this is fulfilled in Jesus Christ, that through his crucifixion, through his resurrection, we have eternal life. And we even have a plan while we're on this earth. And by the way, Rick Warren has often said, there's one thing that you definitely cannot do in heaven, and that is, first of all, sin. You can't sin in heaven. The other thing you can't do is tell people about Jesus Christ and lead them to the Lord. We've been left here on this earth so that we can share the gospel with others. Amen? Now, I think we sometimes think, oh, I, I, I better watch more football. Uh, because, you know, th th this is where all the fun is. Heaven's really, really dull, so I better sort of just have fun here. And God does want us to enjoy life. But I tell you something, very often we forget the things that we're really left here to do, and that is to tell people about Jesus Christ. So watch football with someone who doesn't know Jesus. Might be a good plan. Okay. Um, one of my lecturers at college taught me this. Get a half-truth, make it a whole truth, and you have a heresy. Get a half-truth, make it a whole truth, and you have a heresy. And, and that's what we're going to look at in Jeremiah 29, 11. We're going to try and focus on two aspects of the truth of the promise. I think very often, you see, we like to receive the promise, and, and I want us to receive the promise and believe the promise of Jeremiah 29, 11, but what we often neglect is the responsibility, the things we're supposed to do in order to sustain that promise. Now, it's all grace. It's all what God alone can do, but I want us to think about balance. Uh, everyone just say the word balance. Now, let, let me illustrate this. When it comes to thinking about Jesus, what often happens is that we take half of the side of the story and we focus so much on that half of the story that we neglect the other. So sometimes Jesus in the movies, uh, in the 1960s when Jesus was, was portrayed, he kind of wasn't very human. You, you wouldn't see his face. You didn't see his passion. Uh, and, and they certainly didn't like showing the bit when Jesus drove out the money changers and got the whips out and drove the animals away. And I remember whenever I saw Jesus on, the, on, the, t on, the, on the, the movies, it was really rare. They hardly ever showed him, but you wouldn't see his face. It was like there was a shimmer over him. It's like this sort of a light was over him all the time. Now, that happened on one occasion, but, but we made Jesus so divine that we forgot that he was human. And then there are other portrayals of Jesus that try to convey his humanity so much that, that it almost didn't seem like he was the son of God. And very often, when I studied this at college, we found out that you have to believe in both, 100%, that Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. He's the son of man and the son of God. He's not 50% man and 50% God. He's 100% man and 100% God. Amen? And very often, we get into trouble when we emphasize one and we neglect the other. And that's why we, we want to sing and declare very clearly that he was crucified and that he was, he was raised at the same time. Some only mention the crucifixion. We're going to mention the resurrection. Some only mention the resurrection, but we've got to remember that it's the crucifixion of the risen Lord and the resurrection of the crucified Lord. And so those two truths come together. And so balance is a really vital word in our times. If we want to be a church that stays strong about the truth of the word of God, we've got to get the balance right. I want you to tell someone right next to you right now, get the balance right. Go on, you tell them that. And so I see here... In, uh, well done. I, I see here in Jeremiah 29, 11, that wonderful promise. Everyone say promise. 
God has given us a special promise, if you like, rights that we can claim. Now, I'm loath to use the word rights in one sense because it's all grace, amen? And it's all God's mercy. But there's also that sense in which God gives us rights as his children. I'll mention a scripture about that later. But I want us to see the rights of Jeremiah 29, uh, 11, but also that sense of responsibility. And, and sometimes we can also look at this passage from an individual perspective. It's like my promise, but it's also a corporate promise as well. I know that I have plans for you. That meant Israel. And we often take it very personally, and that's right, we can take it personally, but really the application in the new covenant is, is that this relates to all of us as a church. God has a plan for new hope, the body of Christ. God, God has a plan for every fellowship in the world. You know, for Tynmouth Baptist Church, where Rob Porch has been the music director, I mean, this must have been a crazy church. The pastor was 26, and the music director was 26. And I just thank God for your faithful service, because Rob's still the music director. Can we give God praise for, for our dear brother Rob here? He's just an awesome friend. God's got plans for that church as well. Now, I think sometimes a promise we can get a bit confused. You know, uh, I was listening to the radio the other day to the Gospel Channel, and there's a song I never heard before. I don't know if it's an old one, but it may have been a new one. And I'm, I was thinking, I think that sounds a bit like Beyonce. I thought, Beyonce's on the Gospel Channel. And uh, so I thought, is this a new song? So if it was, I was excited. Anyway, the song goes like this. When Jesus say yes, nobody can say no. Anybody heard that one? Is that, is that, is that a new one, do you think? It's a new one. When Jesus say yes, nobody can say no. So, I thought you liked that. Don't worry, I'm not going to dance like Beyonce. And I'm not sure that Beyonce should dance like Beyonce either. But I tell you, it's a really catchy tune, and it kind of encouraged me because in, in half of it is true. And if you take the half that, like, if God says, he, if I can change the language and help the song a bit and say, if God says he's going to accomplish something, that will be accomplished. Amen? I mean, that's clearly what the scripture says. Um, the problem with the song is that a lot of people said no to Jesus. Jesus said yes, and a lot of people did actually say no to Jesus, and a lot of people do say no to Jesus. Now, can you see what I'm saying? That the, the song's not quite right. Though, though it's catchy, you might be saying, I love that song. But actually, it's not quite right, and uh, I think we need to change it to say something like, you know, when God says he's going to accomplish his purposes, um, <laughs> he will always prevail. It's just not quite as catchy, is it? It doesn't quite kind of work. It's the dance as well. But, uh, and so when we read Jeremiah 29, 11, I want us to not water this verse down one bit. I want us to receive the fullness of it, but try and understand it in the whole context that God is speaking to the whole nation about his entire divine purposes. It's not just, I think we sometimes think God's going to keep providing for us so that we're not going to run out of money before we die. I think some people have that vision of like, I, I just want to be able to die solvent and I'll be happy. God's plans are way bigger than you and I just making it to the end of our life and marrying off our kids and, and, and keeping the grandkids safe and then we die. God has a vision to transform the earth. And that can involve a new hope member going to Pretoria in South Africa and making a difference there. God bless you. But you know, Katie, you've been making a difference while you've been at university and while you've been in our student group as well. God can use us everywhere. These promises, I believe, are way more than just uh, you and I being happy and making it through the day, but let me tell you, he will help you through the day. But I think this promise is way bigger. It's about God transforming all the earth. But first of all, let me declare this truth. We can claim our rights as citizens of the king and his kingdom, amen? And though these are tough times here in verse one with the shadow of Nebuchadnezzar hanging over the people, he was the most brutal man of his time. He was way smarter than ISIS. Uh, he had the same brutality as ISIS, but he also was the man that constructed the hanging gardens of Babylon and uh, his uh, 
uh, home capital of Nineveh, had the largest library in the world. He was not like a cultural Philistine like Isis are, who cared nothing whatsoever. Nebuchadnezzar was like a refined guy, but he had the same intimidation and intensity and brutality as ISIS. And by the way, I want to declare in Jesus' name that God will accomplish everything and one day every knee, including Nebuchadnezzar, including ISIS, one day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so this promise that I have plans for you, plans to prosper you and not harm you, is a promise of God transforming all the earth more than you and I just making it through another month solvent, though may you and I be able to make it through the month solvent, amen? But I want us to claim the fullness of this rights, not just like a, as in a personal thing, but as this corporate transformation. Hebrews 12, 16, and I put this verse in my notes some days ago. Uh, just so I felt I was supposed to share this. Hebrews 12, 16 says, See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal, which in, in fact, it wasn't even solids, it was soup. Who for a single meal, I mean, you know, guys, it's good to have soup occasionally, but you want to eat something real, don't you? He wasn't even eating anything real. Who for a single meal, a bowl of soup, sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. And that's where I got that word rights from. Our inheritance rights are that God has a plan for us as a church. God had a reason for bringing us over to America. God has a reason for assembling us together. That little church that, where we began worshiping 134 years ago, God had a purpose for why those men were praying that this, this church could make a difference in all of the world. That we have special rights. We're going to take the gospel to the ends of the earth and every brother and sister in Christ is going to be gathered together in all eternity. We have these special, special rights. But we also need to balance that with the word responsibility because Esau, though given the special inheritance rights, blew those rights for something insignificant. And I found it quite astonishing that we had a parable outworking uh, in this story. Now, there's a, there's a good end if you're a Georgia Bulldogs fan. And by the way, well, what a parable that is in teamwork. Well done, Georgia Bulldogs. Come on, let's give it up for the Bulldogs. That's a great story. Good teamwork. Some of you are going, I wish that happened. I wanted them to lose. I understand, but I cheer for the Bulldogs anyway. Be quiet. I'm the preacher. <laughs> um, no, great parable there, but what an incredible parable that Todd Gurley was almost certainly going to be the Heisman Trophy winner, which is like, as far as I understand it, a 50-year lasting calling card, probably paid five or 10,000 bucks for every speech you're going to give for the next 50 or 60 years uh, if you live that long. But he was there for the Heisman Trophy, and he exchanged it for something that was the equivalent of a bowl of stew, maybe 400 bucks. So they seem to say so far. Nothing against Todd, and I know the rules of goofy and everything, and the colleges make huge amounts of money out of these kids and everything, but we won't go into that. That's for another time. I'll leave that up to ESPN. They can go on and on and on about it themselves if they wanted to. We're not going to do that in church, but let me tell you, what an incredible parable that you, you can have this blessing, you can have this potential inheritance, and lose it for something way less important, and Hebrews 12, 16 says, like sexual immorality. Some kind of sin that just gets, and we think that's so important, and it drives us to do something, and we can blow our inheritance rights as children of God. Jeremiah 29, 11 is a blessing. It's a right that we can claim, but it goes with a responsibility, and we're not, gonna, we're not called to blow that responsibility either. Everyone say amen to that. Now, we need to clearly ask the question, what does it mean to prosper? Okay, God has given us rights and responsibilities. And by the way, the responsibility is a great blessing itself. It's not a drag. It's not like you can go to heaven, but you've got to do lots of miserable stuff like serving. It's like, hey, isn't it a great thing to serve? Isn't it more blessed to give than receive? And sometimes Christians take hold of the word pro prosperity and say, no, 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 it's much more blessed to get the stuff than to give. 
We twist it round. Instead, Jesus himself said, it's more blessed to give than receive. And still there are preachers that are saying, give, 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 so that you can receive. And they emphasize the receiving so much that we forget that Jesus says, it's more blessed to give than receive. Tell someone next to you right now, it's more blessed to give than receive. You tell them that. Let's get our priority right. We need to ask, what is prosperity? What does this prosperity refer to? If we're claiming Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord corporately, transforming the earth, plans to prosper you, what does that prosperity actually mean? What does that prosperity actually mean? Um, well, of course, in the Old Testament, God wanted to bless the land, and, and there was a physical blessing. And God basically says, if you'll obey me, you're going to be blessed. Things are going to go well for the nation. If you don't obey me, things won't go so well. And so the people set out. They conquered the land. And God blessed them as he said he would. And then the people started saying, we're going to tweak what prosperity means. It's not really more blessed to give than receive. It's really all about getting stuff and getting what we want and satisfying our appetites. Instead of trusting God for provision, we don't need God anymore and we just want to enjoy stuff and, and, and we're going to worship idols and we're going to have sex with whoever what we want to have sex with and we're going to ignore what God has said, just like our, our world is saying right now. And, so it, and then God says, well, I'm afraid you've lost the blessing. I'm afraid there's going to be no more joy in the land for a while. But you know, even in the time of Israel, true prosperity was knowing the Lord. Let's not run down the Old Testament. Old Testament prosperity was not just stuff. Old Testament prosperity was shalom, peace. I said it loud, didn't it, my microphone? Shalom, peace. Uh, I kind of whistled. Did I whistle then? I think I did. I don't know how. I, I probably couldn't do it again if I tried. But God's blessing was shalom, peace. And, and for the people to love God and to worship him, and they went together and they praised God and they worshiped him, and sometimes they fell away and they backslid from him. Prosperity meant more than just things. It meant knowing the Lord. What does prosperity mean for us today? Now, if you're certainly in financial straits right now, if you're in great difficulty, then that's a big deal. And God can help us through that. And there is wisdom, and there's biblical understanding that will help us step by step, and we have to be very patient and work our way out of it, and God will help us, and he will get you through. And I know that there are so many in this place that would testify to the goodness of God in the area of our finances. In fact, well done, New Hope, for coming through the recession. You know, so far this, this year, our giving, uh, the latest uh, update has been up 7% during 2014. Can we give God praise for that and thank him for his provision? <laughs> Jesus was interested in people's physical bodies. He healed the sick. He helped the blind. He even raised someone from the dead. He fed 5,000. Jesus understands our physical needs. In fact, he taught us that our heavenly father knows everything that we need. In fact, he even knows the number of hairs on our head or the number of hairs that are not on our head. He knows everything about us. And he provides for our needs, but Jesus showed us surely that prosperity is more than just stuff. In fact, he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Why worry about clothes, what you shall wear, and what you shall eat? Don't spend all your life, and don't we actually do that? We spend loads of time thinking about what we're going to wear and what we're going to eat. In fact, in Fayette County on a Friday night, if it's not football, it's what we're going to wear and what we're going to eat. And Jesus said, the pagans run after those things, and God will provide for our needs. But I want you to focus on the kingdom of God. True prosperity is found in the kingdom of God. I want you to tell someone right now, I'm keeping you active this morning on this vacation weekend. We're not having a vacation right now. We're active in the word of God. Amen. Tell someone right now that their prosperity is in the kingdom of God. Go on, you tell them. And if you believe that's true, would you give God praise, everyone, if you believe that is absolutely true? What is prosperity? I want to say this about prosperity. Um, I, I know that it's very popular to teach this, that, that just give and it'll all come back to you. And that, that does happen sometimes. And I thank God for his provision. And it's amazing. You can't outgive God. But I do know this, that sometimes God's plan in your life is for him to withhold. Everyone say withhold. Elijah prayed, Lord, 
please don't let it rain for three years because it won't be good for the nation. We need it not to rain. And I tell you what, some of you are going through a season of withholding. And that's okay because during those seasons of withholding, that's often when we grow the most. In fact, have you often noticed that when things go well and we're successful, just like Israel, that's often when we forget the Lord. And so God puts us through a season of withholding, and that can be for our good, that can be for our blessing, because prosperity is not found in what you have, it's who you are. When it comes to your legacy, I can assure you, the real issue will be, are there loved ones who are around you? The issue will not be how much there is in your bank balance, because I tell you what, it's not going with you. Your true legacy, your true testimony is about your relationship with God and your relationship with other people, not your relationship with money. If if God has provided substantially with you, then he can use that in a mighty way if your heart is fully surrendered to God. But I tell you what, Pastor Paul told Pastor Timothy, you've got to teach the people. In fact, one thing that you must command the people, particularly the rich, to not trust in those riches, but to trust in God. What is true prosperity? I think we're kind of preaching to our own hearts right now, saying, God, help me to find my prosperity in you. Help me to find my prosperity in obeying your mission, being the kind of person who is a blessed person. That's who I want to be. Tell someone right now, that's who I want to be. Go on, you just tell them that. Okay, we've talked about the rights. we talked about the blessings. Can we just clarify that? If you're a child of God, you have eternal life. If you're a child of God, you have forgiveness of sins. Claim your rights right now. If you're a child of God, you've been adopted into his family. If you're a child of God, he's brought you out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his marvelous light. And Rob, you can testify, none of us went to church. All our friends, we didn't know Jesus. We thought we were Christians because we were British. Okay? But in the 1970s, and we had, we had the Bible in school, but we didn't know Jesus for ourselves. And Rob will tell you that God took hold of, of a punk rocker, and we were talking about him the other day, and then God, a few weeks later, took hold of me, and then God took hold of you. And Rob, you were almost like a reluctant con- convert. You are almost like came along, you are one of the last of my friends to get saved. But I tell you what, you've gone on strong for Jesus Christ. Do you know why? Because you've inherited the rights of a son. Your sins are being forgiven. You've been taken out of the kingdom of darkness. You've been in the kingdom of light. And that's why, Rob and Fiona Porch, you've been living for Jesus. Jesus this last 30 odd years because you're a child of the king it's not about you it's about what Christ has done in your life and I thank God for my brother and sister who've been saved out of darkness and into his marvelous light that's my inheritance as a child of the king that's your inheritance in fact you're not a Christian because your daddy was a deacon you're not a Christian because you're American you're only a Christian because Christ is living within you and you've surrendered to him and you've asked him to fill you with his spirit and you are alive in Christ the helium has filled your balloon and you're standing tall and you're standing strong and nothing can ever take that away from you that's what it means to be a Christian I'm a, I, my sins are forgiven I've been alive that's what it's all about amen we believe in God the Father we be, that's all the kind of stuff the stuff that we sing about that's what our true prosperity is all about that's your rights and with the rights come responsibilities to live in that. And we've got an example of this in verse 12. It's a life of prayer. Look down at verse 12. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me. Everyone say pray. It's a right to pray. We can pray in the name of Jesus. We come to our heavenly Father through Jesus Christ, who is seated at the right hand of God, our intercessor. It's a right, but it's also a responsibility I'm called to pray. It's not a burden. It's not a horrible thing, but sometimes it burdens me and weighs upon me, and sometimes prayer is a battle, and sometimes we wrestle in prayer, but I tell you what, we are called to a life of prayer. If you want to be a Jeremiah 29, 11 person, you've got to be a Jeremiah 29, 12 person as well. You can't separate prayer from God's purposes and his plans and God's prosperity. But show me a prosperous person and you'll also find a praying person as well. You may say, well, pastor, I know rich people who don't pray. Let me tell you, they are not prosperous. I know people with lots of stuff, and and they've done it without God. Let me tell you, that's not going to stay that way for very long, because one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Secondly, 
seeking and finding is a responsibility as well. Verse 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. God's perfect plans in our lives are discovered as we seek him and we ask him and we yearn for God to be in our lives. Can I have an amen for that as well? So the rights of the children of God are wonderful. The responsibilities include praying and seeking him, but isn't that part of the blessing as well? I don't want a prosperity that is separate from a relationship with God. My relationship with God is the thing that sustained me. Thirdly, as we look at that interesting verse, verse five, build houses. Maybe there's a builder in the, in the house right now and you're going, amen. And God tells the people to build houses, settle down, plant gardens, and eat what they produce. That was a specific word to the exiles who'd been taken out of Israel to Babylon. And God's word was, you're going to stay there for 70 years, and then you're going to come back. And eventually, Nehemiah will come back from one of the, being one of the exiles, and he will rebuild the walls. And Ezra was there to rebuild the temple, and that was God's preparation for Jesus, the Messiah, to come and die on the cross and rise again so that you and I can have the full blessing, amen? But in the meantime, the people were told to be very practical. That's our third point. Part of our responsibility as a follower of Christ is to be practical. We don't want to be so heavenly minded to be of no earthly use, and so the people were called to to do something. And so I just wanna say, brothers and sisters in Christ, As we enter into God's prosperity, as we remind ourselves of the wonderful plans and rights that he's given to us, then let's make sure that we also do the things that he tells us to do. So for instance, it can be like this. God has laid on some of your hearts to start a new ministry or to start a Sunday school class or to start going to a Sunday school class or to invest in the next generation or to invest in your own generation. God has laid something on your heart. There comes a point when we have to do it. For instance, our Spanish ministry, we talked about doing a Spanish ministry. We knew that there was a need out there, but eventually we needed an anointed man of God, and it was through Al Mead's leadership with the relationship with Angel that developed that it was time for us to say, we're gonna start. We're gonna do something, and we're gonna make a difference In this people group, we'll start small, but God's going to bless us. Hey, we're going to start a horse ministry. We've been talking about that very soon, but it's now fully funded. Most of the course has been cut out there. We're going to be able to serve uh, those with special needs in our community very, very soon. And we'll be telling you more about that. It's taken quite a while. We had to persuade uh, the local council that uh, we're not starting like a... uh, what do we call it, Al? Some kind of a massive uh, stable or anything like that. We're just, we're just opening our land so people can, can be served in that way. You know, sometimes the kingdom of God is intensely practical. So the mission trip to Haiti recognizes that we're trying to build an orphanage there. And we've cut the land and New Hope has supplied wonderfully to those who are in need. There comes a point when we've got to be practical for the kingdom of God. And so to be a Jeremiah 29, 11 person also means to be a practical person as well. And I want you to think about this. Just two simple words. Is there something that God is calling you to be faithful about? Maybe you're a member of the choir. Maybe you're serving with the children's ministry. Maybe you're serving with a ministry I've already mentioned. Is there something that God just wants you to be faithful with? Well, let me encourage you, as you claim your rights as a child of the king, and as you are reminded of your responsibilities, continue with that ministry faithfully and with joy, filled with the Spirit, and serve the Lord wholeheartedly, and he will have the glory and praise. Amen? That's an encouragement to us all. But here's the other word. You may be called to be to be faithful, you may also be called to do something fresh. It may well be that as you carry on being faithful, there's something that God would even add to your life. Because you know, part of prosperity and spiritual prosperity is multiplication of ministry. And that is being used in a mighty way. Let me ask you, brother and sister church member, is God using you? Are you surrendering to the plans that he has for you? 
Maybe sometimes somebody invites you to serve alongside them. Sometimes that's God speaking to you. Iris Gleason says to you, hey, I need this help. There's 70 ladies now in Iris Gleason Sunday school class. I mean, actually 70 attending very often on a Sunday morning. And I'm sure, Iris, sometimes you're going to have to say, hey, ladies, I need someone to help me with this. And that's, that's often God speaking to us about getting involved. Or Pastor Al says, hey, I need someone to help with Upward. And, and he gives a call there. And sometimes that is God speaking to us. Sometimes we don't realize that God is trying to involve us in something fresh for the kingdom of God. So I've got that question. Just as Angel Adams voluntarily said, you know what? God's calling me uh, to, to serve in this ministry. I thank God for him. that He availed himself. And now every week we're able to minister to those that speak a different language. And we're so thrilled that they're going to be with us.